Russia's ability to see, understand, characterize aircraft in the air has dim- been demonstrated over and over to be lacking. And so this could be yet one more example. Who knows, it could have been a Russian that shot this aircraft down. We'll find out more in the future. <clears throat> Remember back to the story of MH17. Uh, within Literally, within minutes, Russia had three or four stories out on the street about how the CIA caused that shoot down, et cetera, et cetera, or staged that shoot down. <clears throat> and we found out definitively later exactly what we knew almost immediately, and that was it was Russia shooting down that aircraft. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio. I'm James Hansen. And today we're once again talking about the war in Ukraine with General Philip Breedlove. General Breedlove is a highly decorated four-star general who served for 39 years. He was commander of U.S. European Command, as well as Supreme Allied Commander Europe of NATO Allied Command Operations. General Breedlove, we always appreciate your time. Welcome back to Frontline. It's good to be back. Look forward to our conversation. Let's just begin with some breaking news we've had in in the past few hours. Uh, A Russian plane carrying 65 Ukrainian prisoners of war has crashed in Belgorod near the border with Ukraine. Russia has accused Ukraine of downing it, although there is zero evidence for that. I appreciate this is a breaking story and, and the details are, are very uh, are very sketchy at the moment. But what is your sense of what may have happened? Well, uh, first of all, nothing that you first hear is going to be absolutely right. There's two sides to every story. And what we're hearing so far is a little bit hard to believe. If Russia was uh, bringing back uh, Ukrainian prisoners, it would make complete sense that they would have coordinated that flight and Ukraine would have known about the flight and Ukraine would have not been involved with shooting it down. So this sounds a bit far-fetched, the story that Russia is putting out there. Rather, we may have some sort of a an issue with an aircraft that caused it down, and this is the story that Russia is using to cover it. I think that we should not overreact to any of these possibilities right now. There's a lot of dust that will need to settle, and um, and as as I said before, there's always two sides to every story. I think that's that's really important to say, and, and thank you for stressing it, General, that obviously details are, are very light on the ground at the moment. But were, for instance, Russia to be found to be responsible for this, I suppose, sadly, it would it would fit in with a pattern that we've seen from Putin's regime over the years of targeting aircraft. Well, it, in so, as much as targeting aircraft as having poor situational air, uh, awareness of what aircraft are. The shooting down of MH17 is a prime example when the Russians shot that down in eastern Ukraine. Um, Russia's ability to see, understand, characterize aircraft in the air has been demonstrated over and over to be lacking. And so this could be yet one more example. Who knows, it could have been a Russian that shot this aircraft down. We'll find out more in the future. <clears throat> Remember back to the story of MH17, uh, within literally within minutes, Russia had three or four stories out on the street about how the CIA caused that shoot down, et cetera, et cetera, or staged that shoot down. <clears throat> and we found out definitively later exactly what we knew almost immediately, and that was it was Russia shooting down that aircraft. So we will we, we just need to remain calm here for a little bit and let this all sort out. And just finally on, on this particular incident, General, if Russia is found to be responsible, if that can be proven, what would be an appropriate response from the West? Well, add this to the list of war crimes that we have seen. I mean, Mr. Putin's army has weaponized murder, it's weaponized rape, it's weaponized torture even of young people, it's weaponized deportation of of families and kids into Russia, and just add this to one more piece of the list of things that Russia will need to be held accountable for um, in the international criminal courts. 
Let's turn to the situation that we're seeing at the moment on the front line in Ukraine. What is your sense of where we are with this war at the moment? Well, there's a lot of talking going on that we need to sort of sort through what is the signaling. Um, uh, first and foremost, I think we need to examine what's going on in my country. Sadly, we are in a, a decidedly political uh, season and our uh, Congress, which has been completely supportive of Ukraine to this point, when I say completely, we have we have this this sort of outlying faction on the left and this sort of outlying faction on the right, but the middle on both sides of the aisle has been supportive of Ukraine. And now this is all tied up in election politics and border politics and so forth. And so the signaling out of my country is really not good right now. We are, we have said over and over, and and both sides of the aisle have said over and over that we'll be there for as long as it takes, and we're going to give them everything they need. And we find ourselves now uh, falling off of our promises to Ukraine. And I think that in America we need to re-examine what's important in the world. And one thing that I know is not important is America being an isolationist country. And then secondarily, there's a lot of narratives in Ukraine. There are those who want to defeat funding for Ukraine around the world by saying that Ukraine has failed and et cetera, et cetera. Ukraine is is uh, talking about having switched now to an active defense, and all of these narratives are sort of clouding what's happening. So, um, yes, there are some challenges on the battlefield. Yes, we would have liked to have gotten more out of this uh, offensive than we did. But let's just remind that without a single capital ship, Ukraine has the initiative in the Northern Black Sea. Let's just remind that the ingenuity of the fighting forces in Ukraine are teaching the world how to fight with drones. Let's just remind ourselves that the West, since since May of 1953, has not sent its forces into battle unless they had battlefield air superiority. And Ukraine has been fighting for two years without air superiority. We have not, we have not given them the capability, the kit, or what they need to establish battlefield air superiority. And so this this brave fighting force has been out there fighting under a condition that the West would never accept. No Western commander would accept what Ukraine is having to fight under. And so, yes, there are some challenges on the battlefield. Yes, Russia is losing manpower at a rate that is unfathomable to us. And these things are going to add up in the future. And, and I don't think that's as bleak as people want to paint. I think those who are painting a bleak picture for Ukraine have a political objective. And do you think that the part of the way may be that support, Western support for Ukraine can be revitalized is to better communicate the wins that Ukraine is having on the battlefield? I mean, you, you mentioned rightly the success they've had in the Black Sea. Also, in recent weeks, we, we've seen their success at targeting Russian energy infrastructure and particularly uh, gas plants in in and around St. Petersburg. Maybe that's not getting the attention that, that similar breakthroughs were having two years ago, but maybe it should. Well, <clears throat> I, I'm not going to point at other governments. I believe they have the same problem. I can point at mine. And our government, our senior leadership has not gone to the American public and made the case for why Ukraine is important and why we need to make, move forward. The other narrative that just isn't out there and it's surprising is, no, we would never want to look at war in a business sense. It's just not a business. But let's talk about what has happened in Ukraine. The United States, I can speak to those numbers. The United States has used about 4%, some say as low as 3.5%, some say as high as 5 but 
about 4% of one year of DOD budget. The equivalent of, let's say that again, 4% of one year of DOD's budget has been expended towards supporting Ukraine. For that, again, there is a, a range. Some people say as low as 42. Some people say as high as 51 percent of Russia's frontline forces have been destroyed. So not a single Western soldier dead other than those who volunteered and went in there and fought for Ukraine. About 4% of one year of DOD fund budget, not U.S. budget, DOD budget. And almost half or at least half of Russia's frontline forces destroyed. No one's telling that story. No one is pointing out that. And in the United States, we talk about the money that we have given to Ukraine. It's a misnomer. It's badly stated. Again, I think it has political purpose. 60% of the budget that we have expended to support Ukraine have gone right back into U.S. industry, U.S. jobs, U.S. households, U.S. paychecks. And so no one has made these arguments well to the people. And I'm, I'm assuming that these are all pretty close to the same in other countries. And so no one is out there, I'm going to just close with this by saying, no one is out there pointing out how important Ukraine is to the Western world and how well our investments in Ukraine have paid off in disrupting a world superpower who now for the third time has demonstrated since the end of the Cold War that it will amass its army, march across an internationally recognized border, invade, conquer portions, and subjugate portions of a neighboring nation. There's been a lot of talk in, in recent weeks, General, about the prospect of at some point, maybe in a few years' time, maybe in decades, of a full-scale war between NATO and Russia. And it was interesting recently, the German NATO commander, Lieutenant General Jürgen Joachim van Sandrart, outlining a scenario in which Russian forces sever the Savolki Gap, the land bridge connecting the Baltic states with the rest of NATO, and then a full-scale war ensues. Do you see that as realistic? So I would never criticize his thoughts. I think his thoughts are guided by what he's seeing on the ground. And frankly, uh, I don't receive classified briefings anymore because I want to be able to talk to you and others. And so I read what you read, and he may be reading something else. Here's a few thoughts that I do believe. Right now, I believe Russia understands what a NATO nation is and what a NATO boundary is. And I believe at this point, we still have some, not as much as we used to, but we still have some deterrence when it comes to NATO land and nations. I think we have lost all vestige of deterrence outside of NATO. And sadly, I put some of that on the backs of our leaders. How many times did our leaders say, we're going to Defend every inch of NATO. What is the message to non-NATO nations? Okay. What is the message that Mr. Putin hears when we say we're going to defend every inch of NATO? And so I think outside of NATO spaces, we have lost any deterrence that we used to have. And Mr. Putin feels the green light. People are talking about Ukraine. We need to remember that right now, in the gray zone, in the hybrid zone, whatever you want to call it, Russia is active, incredibly active in the country of Georgia. In the gray zone, and to some degree in the physical, more kinetic zone, Russia is active in Moldova, in Transnistria, et cetera, et cetera. And so this war is already bigger than Ukraine. And Russia has written about its aspirations for how it wants to change the uh, security infrastructure of Eastern Europe. And so we need, to, we need to wake up a little bit and understand that Russia is moving in spaces outside of NATO. So now let me get to your question. I've sort of been laying the groundwork. At some point, um, 
if the West continues to back up, acquiesce uh, to Russia's advantages in the non-NATO spaces, at some point they're going to bump into NATO. Um, you know, recently missiles have flown and hit in Poland. Missiles down in the extreme corner, down by the Danube, have flown and hit very close to Romania. Um, if Russia keeps acting uh, foolishly in these areas, at some point they're going to bump into NATO. And so we can't dismiss the possibilities that some are talking about. And let's just say for the sake of arguments, Russia did move on the Baltic states. A lot of people would say, well, NATO has the capabilities to defeat Russia relatively straightforwardly. But but is that the case? I mean, particularly when you consider the geographic advantages that Russia would have, it, particularly if they moved quite quickly and, and took NATO by surprise. So there are all manner of uh, there are all manner of um, scenarios. One of one of the men in America I respect the most for his thoughtfulness is Dave Achmanik. And he has said more than once that that uh, the 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 uh, Baltic nations are undefensible, et cetera, et cetera. I don't agree with him, but he's well thought, and I understand how he comes to some of his conclusions. Yes, Russia could do some quick, impactful work, but I think maybe even you and others would agree with me. Russia's conventional forces have been diminished. And they have been diminished in a great degree. I don't think Russia, even even the craziest of the crazies, thinks they can beat NATO on a conventional battlefield. Yes, they may make some immediate gains, but in a conventional fight, uh, Russia um, would lose. I, I'm convinced 100% they would lose. Um, and, uh, um, so that's the end of that. The real question is about how Russia's nuclear, uh, forces would come into play. I mean, you probably read, uh, um, in Reuters, what now a week ago about Medvedev's comments that's, and basically I'm going to paraphrase, you know, Russia is firing into Ukraine from nearly 300 degrees around the globe using North Korean kit, using uh, Iranian kit, uh, using any kit they can get from anywhere. They're firing thousands and thousands over the war of rounds into Ukraine. Medvedev pops up and says, if Ukraine uses any foreign kit to fire into Russia, we'll have to use nuclear weapons. I hope you've read this same mm, yes, speech. Yeah. So what is clear to me is Russia understands what deters the West, and the West is deterred. We told Russia before this war what we're afraid of. We were afraid of the war expanding and Russia using nukes. So what does Russia talk about? Nearly every week, somebody at a very high level talks about one or both of those possibilities. They continually remind us of what we told them we were afraid of, and they continually threaten us with those things. And so how Russia plays its nuclear card, I think, is something that is to be dealt with in the future. How should we approach that then? Because we don't want to lead Russia on. We don't want to embolden them. But equally, the threat of, of a nuclear conflict is horrific. So from the West's perspective, how should we respond to the threat of a nuclear attack? So the first thing I think we have to accept is if we never say no, if we never take a stand, we lose. If we continually back up and back up and back up and back up, we lose. So if we take the tact that we are taking now, there is no good outcome for us. OK, um, think about what we've done to Ukraine. Once again, Russia is firing in from nearly 300 degrees around the globe using everybody's kit they can get a hold of. They're firing in. We have spoken to Ukraine and said, this is all sanctuary. Russia is sanctuary. Belarus is sanctuary. Northern, you know, this is all sanctuary and you cannot use our kit to fire back at Russia. 
I mean, this is this is no way to fight a war. We are asking Ukraine to fight under conditions that we in the West would never, never accept. And so the first thing we have to get over is that the only answer is to acquiesce and to allow Russia um, this this deterrent advantage. You know, the, the old dead guys, we call them, when we study in National War College and other places, the Clausewitz, the Jomanese, the Sun Tzu's, they are often talk about things that you should and shouldn't do. They don't all agree, but some of their axioms line up rather well. Two that line up rather well is, and I'm paraphrasing terribly, but they say, you should seek to deter your enemy and not allow your enemy to deter you. And they also say, seek and gain and hold the initiative. So in this war, we have done neither. We are deterred, and clearly Russia is not deterred. Okay? And uh, we had started from the very first of this war, we gave the initiative to Russia. Everything we did was, if you do this, we're going to do that. That's reactive. That is giving Russia the initiative. So we have lost deterrence and we have lost the initiative. And these are not places you want to be as a fighting force against uh, um, a global superpower. So just give me an example then, General, of what you think the West could do to regain the initiative. Okay, so people ask me all the time, uh, what do we need to give Ukraine so that they would win? And and we're all guilty uh, to a certain degree of thinking it's a shiny object. Oh, it's the F-16. Oh, it's the MLRS. Oh, it's the you know, javelin missile. And we think of these shiny objects. I tell people all the time that the thing that Ukraine needs most from the West, and again, I'll just speak to my country, but I believe it's the same for all of them. The thing that Ukraine needs the most is not a thing at all. Ukraine needs a stated declaratory policy from the West that says, what we intend. We use these two sentences all the time. We're going to be there as long as it takes. We're going to give them everything they need. Okay, forgive me. I'm going to be a bit flippant. We're going to be there as long as it takes to do what? Hold a birthday party? Cross the bridge? Retake an oblast? Kick Russia out? There is not a finish to that sentence in policy. We're going to give them everything they need. To what? Have a birthday party, cross the river, retake an oblast or whatever. We need a publicly stated declaratory policy that says, in my opinion, what the people of Ukraine has said to us. And that is we want all Russians out of all sovereign Ukrainian territory. And Crimea is a Ukrainian peninsula, not a Russian peninsula a Ukrainian peninsula. And so for me, the first thing we need to give Ukraine is a statement that we could just use what we're doing now and what the Ukrainian people have said to us. We're going to be there as long as it takes to eliminate Russian forces inside of Ukraine and retake all Ukrainian land. We're going to give them everything they need to eliminate all Russian forces inside Ukraine and retake Ukrainian land. And once we make that declaratory policy, everything else falls into place. The, and now to get to the kit, we, we're, again, I'm asked, okay, I get it, I get it, we need a policy. But what do we need to give them? And I offer that we should give them what we would give ourselves if we were going to go do that mission. No Western force goes to the battlefield without air superiority. How do we enable Ukraine to establish air superiority? It's more than an F-16. It's more than Patriots or THAAD. It's command and control, sensors, communication, all the things that go into a network that provides air superiority over the battlefield. Um, we give them long-range precise fires. Uh, um, an American commander 
if he was or she was told, you're going to battle, but you can't use your ATACMs, their head would explode. They would never accept that. Uh, and we are we are handicapping Ukraine by giving them kit that is purposely not fit for purpose. You know, again, Crimea is a Ukrainian peninsula. We should be giving Ukraine the ability to strike the entire length and breadth of Crimea. I use the three P's. We need to be able to strike Crimea pervasively, persistently, and precisely. Not civilian targets, but we need to keep all the military targets on the entire peninsula under pervasive fire, under persistent fire, and under precise fire. If we did that, um, the military situation on Crimea would change, but we don't do that. So when I'm asked again, what would we, what would I give Ukraine? Uh, to change the dynamic. I just simply say, give them what we would take to this battle if it was us in this battle. General Breedlove, it's always a privilege having you on the front line. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be back. Thank you for watching this episode of Frontline for Times Radio. For more on the war in Ukraine, subscribe to the Times Radio YouTube channel. Listen to Times Radio on your digital radio or you can read the Times online with your digital subscription or in print. Thank you and goodbye.